this video, we're going to be continuing our study of the vector data model, but we're going to be turning our attention to the attribute tables. We said that when we're thinking about vector data, that we should think about points, lines, areas, or polygons, and if you're going to move into three dimensions, then volumes or multi-patches. But we also said that the core of vector data theory is that you have this geometric representation, and it's linked to an attribute table. The geospatial representation of the phenomenon you're interested in resides in the geometry, and all of the aspatial information that you want to hold about those features resides in the attribute table. We gave an example of how we might use point geometry to represent fire hydrants in GIS. This would certainly let us represent the geographic location of each of these hydrants. But there's also a lot of other aspatial information that you might want to store about the hydrants. You might want to know when the last time it was painted, or the last time the fire department tested it, or when the last time was that it was used in an actual fire emergency, or other information like that. This information would be stored in the attribute table. We want to study the construction of an attribute table here, because lots of times when people open up the attribute table, they just think of it as a spreadsheet, because in a general sense they look like spreadsheets with columns and rows, and in general students are often very familiar with spreadsheets from using programs like Apple's Numbers or Microsoft's Excel. But there are some very important differences between attribute tables and spreadsheets. Attribute information is often stored in a simple database format, but one that's much more structured than a spreadsheet, and you have to take this structure into account when you're creating and using attribute tables. With spreadsheets, people are used to just typing in whatever they want into a cell, and then having a lot of control over how the information in the spreadsheet looks, making cells different colors, making text bold or of different sizes, uh, or other things of that nature. We don't do any of that with an attribute table. You won't be changing the colors of cells or text or changing the formatting or anything like that in an attribute table. It's just about storing data and doing it efficiently so that a computer can manipulate the data. When you're working with an attribute table, you have to be proactive in thinking about what data you're going to need to store and how it should be stored. This is what trips people up when they don't think about what data they will want to store in a particular column or field as columns are called in GIS, in advance. That's why everyone in GIS runs into the problem at some point where they want to enter some data into a cell in an attribute table, but the table won't accept the input. And that's because you're trying to enter some data into a cell in the attribute table that the field was not set up to accept. As it happens, when you add this new column called a field, we'll just call them fields from now on, into the attribute table, you'll be asked what kind of data you would like to store in that field, and once you specify it, it's set forever. In this way, it's roughly the equivalent of the geometry of a GIS data file. If you recall, I said that once you specify the kind of geometry a data file will hold, it's set forever. This is the exact same way with the attribute table. Once you declare what kind of data a particular field will hold, it's set forever. So what kinds of data might you want to store in the attribute table? Well, there are a number of different options, and we'll address them in no particular order. For one, it's particularly common to want to store numbers in the attribute table. We can easily think of hundreds of reasons we might want to store numbers in an attribute table. We might want to store the population of countries, or the areas of regions, a measurement of rainfall in a location, or perhaps the number of votes cast uh, for a candidate in a particular voting district. And fortunately, yes, numbers are something that an attribute table will let us store. But we do have to be more specific than just number. We have to specify what kind of number we would like to store. In order to determine what kinds of numbers you need, you need to ask yourself two questions about the data that you're going to be storing. And by the way, if you have a database background or an IT background, you'll probably recognize all of these data types. These are not specific to GIS, they're the same data types that are used in all kinds of aspatial database management systems. So when you need to store a number, there are two major questions that you need to ask yourself about the number that you need to store in order to decide what data type you're going to need to declare for the field. First, ask yourself if the number that you need to store will need to include decimal places, fractional values, yes or no. Depending on your answer, you'll need to make some choices about what field type to declare rather than others. Secondly, you'll need to ask yourself how large a number this field uh, will need to store. 
Based on that answer, you will also make some choices rather than others. Let's say that you don't need to store any kind of fractional values in the field. If you don't need to store fractional numbers, then what you're going to need to store are integers. And you should probably remember that uh, term from math class even years ago. Integers are often called whole numbers because they don't include any fractional component to them. Okay, so once you've made this choice, then you have two options depending on how large an integer you're going to need to store. You've got short integer and long integer. The short integer data type allows a field to store whole numbers between negative 32,768 and 32,767. As long as all of the values that you need to store in the field are whole numbers between those two values, then the short integer data type is what you need. What if you only need to store integers, but the numbers that you're going to need to store are larger or smaller than that? Well, you have another option, the long integer. Long integers allow you to store whole numbers between negative 2,174,483,648 and 2,147,483,647. You might have already encountered a situation where you tried to enter a number into a cell in a field that the computer just was not able to accept. The reason may well be because the field had been established for short integers and the number you're trying to enter is too large for that data type and so it can't input the number. The field is not capable of holding the input that you're trying to enter. By the way, you might think that these numbers you're seeing look rather arbitrary. They're actually not and I'll show you where they come from but we'll get to that in a bit. For now, let's move on to say that you do need to store decimals, fractional values for your numbers. If that's the case, then the integer data type isn't going to help you, but you have two options. You can declare the field as a single precision floating point number, also known as just a float, and you can store numbers between negative 3.4 e38 to 1.2 e to the 38. That's quite a large range there, but if you need to store numbers that are either smaller or larger than that, then you have the option to declare the double precision floating data type, also known as a double, which can store numbers between negative 2.2 E308 to 1.8 E308. If you need to store a larger or smaller number than that, I'm sorry, you can't uh, in many GIS software packages. You're just going to be out of luck. Fortunately, that seems to be a very large range. So it's probably going to work for you in most circumstances. So some of you may be wondering why you need to be concerned about all of this. After all, a long integer can store everything a short integer can plus some, so why not just always declare a long integer data type for a field that you're creating uh, whenever you need to store a number? Likewise, if you need fractional values, why not just always use the double precision floating point field type? Similarly, if you do think that the numbers look rather arbitrary, you may be asking yourself why some programmer putting together GIS software would have chosen numbers like that to be the upper and lower bound for the different integer and fractional value data types. While all of this is important to be concerned with, and it isn't arbitrary, it has to do with the computer's ability to store numbers, and we'll look at these issues in the next video.